Welcome, Peter Gelb. It's such an honor and pleasure to talk to you today. So you are the general manager of the largest opera house of the world, 3,800 3, seats and standing room, I think almost 3,000 employees and an operating budget of over $300 million. And yet your opera house is closed, has been since March 12th. How did you feel when you had to announce the closure um, of the rest of the season and then the fall season? And how do you feel now? Well, you know, this has uh, been a very uh, difficult uh, and uh, surreal experience from the beginning, and uh, it doesn't get any less strange, certainly, as we see the events taking place in the world. And, you know, obviously the Met may be the largest opera house, uh, it's, but it's a very small part of, uh, of uh, society uh, when you consider the, the scale and scope of the impact um, and the devastation that is taking place in this country and uh, uh, in other parts of the world, um, you know we are merely a, a, a small player in, in this in this larger uh, picture. Um, but it's uh, you know it's running running an institution like the Met with uh, um, its three thousand employees, most of whom are uh, on furlough at the moment, um, is. Uh, a, a difficult challenge, even in the best of times, um, and because the economic uh, structure of of, op of an opera house today is um, barely viable to begin with, and uh, to have the added stress of this uh, economic uh, disaster that's befallen us uh, um, certainly just makes it makes it that much more difficult, a lot more difficult. I mean, uh, so it's. These are these are these are very strange times, um, and uh, for people running opera companies, for people working in opera companies, for people who wish they could go, be going to hear opera performances, uh, for everybody in every walk of life. Uh, well, sure. Certainly, every aspect of of my life um, has been affected by what's going on today. Yeah, thank you. One of the extraordinary things I think that the Met has been doing right after the lockdown is to offer free streamings every single evening. Um, and I think the Met has heralded that other opera houses are offering judicial festivals or a selection of shows or one show a night uh, in a week, but you do one show a night. Um, I think at the beginning there were like 70,000 people um, watching every evening. How has that initiative developed and what responses have you received from that? Well, you know, you have to um, understand the history of the Met to understand the importance of its media activities and how they um, have, be have been so impactful um, on, the on the company and uh, the world of opera lovers. You know, the Met um, is uniquely placed amongst performing arts companies in that in that since our um, we believe so strongly in in the uh, distribution of our content via electronic means uh, that we have a literally we have a global audience uh, the the met live and HD transmissions to movie theaters that take place in in better times um, when we're performing uh, reach a paying audience uh, in cinemas of between two and 400,000 people per show. Um, and 70% of those people are outside of the United States. So it just gives you an idea of, of uh, how significant uh, uh, its impact is. And, but the history of the Met and the media goes back many, many decades. It actually began in the early 1930s. Uh, interestingly, as a response to the Great Depression, when my illustrious predecessor, Giulio Gatti Casaza, uh, the Italian empresario who moved from running La Scala uh, in the early 1900s to taking over the Metropolitan Opera House, uh, towards the end of his uh, very long tenure, I think the last 30 years or so, uh, launched the series of radio broadcasts um, across the United States to reach uh, a generation of Americans uh, 
who otherwise would have been deprived of, of kind of any cultural enrichment. And uh, the Met radio broadcasts proved to be a, a pioneering venture of an arts company and media that lasts to this day. Uh, uh, it has a history that is, is more than 80 years old and really is kind of the uh, foundation for what the Met did under my watch when I began as general manager 14 years ago and launched uh, these live transmissions into movie theaters and also expanded our radio presence by, by uh, creating a, a 24 hour opera channel devoted to the Met on Sirius XM, the digital radio service. So, um, and before my, I you know, launched this uh, venture of uh, transmissions into movie theaters, which was really the, uh, the first of its kind uh, 14 years ago, um, the Met had been also a pioneer in the use of standard television and live opera performances going back to the late 70s, uh, which uh, uh, I think the first broadcast for public television was in 1977 or 78 when Luciano Pavarotti and Renato Scotto um, performed uh, in La Boheme together for, for the television cameras. So there's a long history and of, of media activity at the Met. And, you know, uh, during the pandemic, uh, it, it, uh, the value of it uh, became... Uh, all the more apparent because uh, we have this enormous uh, library of content, both pre, pre live in HD and, and post. So altogether several hundred programs and, you know, several thousand hours of, of programming that I felt it would be very important to make available to the public as soon as the pandemic hit. And as soon as we stopped performing, we lost the last eight or nine weeks of our season which normally would ex have extended into early May. Uh, and in March, when we ceased performing, uh, we immediately began transmitting these free nightly streams to the public. And they were a big hit. Uh, and people, um, we had a captive audience, sadly, in that people were literally captive in their own homes. And uh, they responded with, actually the numbers were, were enormous initially, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, flock to the Met website and and watch these nightly operas. Uh, the averages at the beginning of the first weeks and early months were several hundred thousand, um, culminating in a uh, in a, a live uh, what we call the Met at Home Gala, which was watched by seven hundred fifty thousand people, which uh, was done with uh, extremely uh, a, a extremely low tech in which the uh, opera singers themselves homebound were connected by a Skype um, connections and sang into their iPhones and basically functioned as their own camera operators and sound technicians and gaffers. Uh, and, you know, basically they, they produced themselves under our watchful eye. And, uh, and now of course we've just launched this new uh, uh, endeavor, which is uh, a much more high tech, highly produced series of recitals, uh, featuring uh, leading opera stars, um, which just began last Saturday with Jonas Kaufmann in Munich. So, you know, the Met's use of media has been crucial to its um, success in reaching a larger audience during normal times. And in, and in these very abnormal times, it's been crucial in keeping the Met connected to uh, its audience. And in fact, the, uh, perhaps ironically, during, during the, uh, pandemic, while we've been offering all of this content, uh, we've actually increased the number of opera lovers, I believe. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in fact, we have added to our, our uh, database more than 150,000 new names of, of uh, people who we didn't have before, uh, who, who have registered with the Met and who have, some of whom have actually discovered opera during, during the pandemic, thanks to these Metropolitan Opera transmissions. And we also have added about 30,000 new donors. Um, so uh, of course, none of that is going to be the solution to our problems as the health crisis continues and as we grapple with the future. But it's been, it's been a great uh, uh, temporary uh, band-aid, if you will, uh, to help the Met and to help uh, inspire um, donations from our uh, loyal uh, 
supporters, you know, who, who enjoy and feel the Met and who feel proud to see the Met engaging the public in such a positive way. Yeah, that's great. Um, the Met Stars Live and Concert Series that just started is combining focus on individual singers. We have 12 of the greatest opera stars um, around or across Europe and the United States and elsewhere. And you also place a lot of emphasis on the location. Um, how does that work? Who chooses the locations and what kind of gap are you trying to fill with that? What, how, what interest do you think will that create? Well, you know, basically what we're trying to do is provide um, stimulation for the public. You know, my, my whole life as a, as a producer, uh, entrepreneur of, of classical music, long before I came to the Metropolitan Opera, has been devoted to connecting uh, artists with the largest number of people uh, possible. And um, I, you know, seeing a, a situation where in this country, we're literally artists are in straight jackets, they can't travel, they can't move. Uh, in Europe, the situation is somewhat better, but not much better in the sense that there are performances taking place, but under very controlled, limited circumstances with socially distanced audiences. And, and I, you know, personally, I think it's somewhat uh, depressing to be for the artists and for the public to be in, in venues that are only 10% full. Um, so, and, and because we, you know, we're, um, uh, determined to keep the Met, uh, in, in the, um, uh, in the public eye and, and the artists, um, are looking for ways to be connected to the audiences and the audiences are looking for ways to be connected to the audience, to the artists. Um, and nobody can travel. So <laughs> all of this sort of inspired this idea of, uh, creating, a series of events where the artists can be brought into uh, people's homes uh, and that they would perform in venues that did not have a public. So we wouldn't have to worry about seeing a depressing, socially distanced public. We'd see no public. We would just see a beautiful, uh, a beautiful uh, location uh, that, that made sense acoustically. So uh, the, lo the, the, ch the choice of these locations is being made sort of in collaboration with the artists. And I've been working on this project uh, over the past uh, four or five weeks, setting it up. It was all put together very, very quickly, like everything is these days. Uh, you know, opera, we typically in grand opera, we plan four or five years in advance. Now we're planning four or five weeks in advance. That's the difference uh, that the health crisis has created. So, um, you know, in the case of Jonas Kaufman, uh, you know, we agreed, he and I had a series of conversations and uh, we agreed that uh, uh, when he accepted the idea of doing this um, and doing it live, because I'm, that my, I want to maintain the, the, the excitement, you know, this, just to digress for a moment, the, the, the thrill for the audiences who watch the Met live in HD in movie theaters is that it is live because opera fans consider opera singers to be um, vocal athletes. They are as interested in a live performance by their favorite opera stars as they are as sports fans are interested in watching a live uh, uh, athletic endeavor. Nobody wants to watch a taped uh, football game. Um, they want to see it live. And opera fans want to see their favorite singers singing live because they want to see what they will do um, in these uh, artistically exciting and stressful circumstances and how they will deliver their high notes uh, is, is, is as exciting as an, ath as an athletic audience watching a pole vaulter seeing if they're going to clear uh, uh, the, the bar. Uh, so um, knowing that, you know, we try to, we, we, this, this series is meant to sort of, um, I wouldn't say check off a, a number of boxes, but just seems like a, a natural kind of hybrid that whose time has come. Uh, hopefully its time will be limited <laughs> by, by our returning to performing, but I wanted to come up with something that would be exciting and stimulating for the artists and for the audience. So uh, this is what we came up with and we'll see how it evolves. But uh, you know, yeah. In the case of Jonas Kaufman, he was performing in this um, uh, abbey that he chose, uh, but, but you know, and which I we, we did a location scout. Of course, I'm producing all of these things from New York, and what makes these shows particularly unusual is the director of the cameras. In the case of the Kaufman recital, uh, there were five, six cameras. They were all being directed by Gary Halverson, who normally is the director of our live and HD shows, and he was directing them from New York. 
uh, through uh, the best technology possible, we were able to place his voice in the ears of the cameramen in Germany uh, with only a one or two frame delay. So, which is, you know, about an eighth or ninth of a second. And so he was able to uh, direct in real time the cameras. Um, I was sitting next to him producing and talking to the lighting director and the video engineers. And so we were able to actually control the show from New York. Um, and then it came back via satellite to New York where uh, it was being put together live with the, our host, the soprano Christine Gerke. And um, the premise behind that was the idea, I've asked the singers uh, to sing programs that would appeal to the widest taste of our broad opera audience around the world. So instead of being a leader recital, for example, this was a, a, a recital of, in the case of, of Jonas Kaufman, 12 big tenor arias. So he needed uh, breaks uh, between uh, groups of arias, and that consisted of um, our, our uh, adding in New York um, highlights of previous performances of his from the Met stage. So it's a very unusual hybrid kind of uh, a presentation, mm -hmm. but it seems to have been received very well. And uh, um, uh, each location and each, uh, that uh, the locations we've chosen are all in the uh, vicinity of where the artists are located. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the next recital, uh, which takes place on uh, August 1, is in uh, the historic mansion known as Dumbarton Oaks, which has mm -hmm. historical significance and uh, has a beautiful music salon where Renee Fleming, who lives nearby in Virginia, uh, will be performing her recital. And then two weeks after that, uh, Roberto Alanya and his wife, the very gifted soprano, Alexandra Kurzak, are performing a recital of um, arias and duets, but near near where they're currently ensconced in Antibes, uh, and uh, the actual location of their concert will be on the on the hill on the cliff of uh, that runs uh, in the town of Ez in the south of France. Uh, there's a there's a, uh, a fantastic uh, hotel that's sort of carved out of rock and they have these terraces overlooking the Mediterranean. So there'll be, that'll be an outdoor event with the two of them and, and a quintet from Vienna playing orchestrations of, of popular operatic material. And so it goes on. Uh, Fantastic. So it sounds like each concert will also have its own flavor, its own location, its own take. Right. Um, and, at was, time, and at a time when people can't travel, it also gives them a chance to see things that they yeah. wouldn't they can't get to see. So. We all wish we could be there. Um, I was surprised to see you in the production booth in Manhattan clasping your mask. It seemed like when you were talking to Christine Gerke, will you produce or co-produce or be part of all of these um, concert productions? Well, I'm producing all of them. I'm not, I don't think I necessarily will have a presence in all of them, uh, but uh, I wanted to, since that was the first one, I wanted to explain to the audience what, what, why we were doing it and, and what, what to expect. Great. What I find so interesting about the series and also the at home gala is that they really shift focus, uh, they shift the attention to the individual singers, the great stars of opera, of course, that we all enjoy hearing. Um, I'm wondering, do you think that the new viewing and listening habits that we are all developing now during the COVID era will change expectations for opera on the long run, or may even change opera on the long run? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, you know, I, I do know that um, the live and HD presentations have had a profound influence already on opera because uh, it has made it clearer to opera singers how important it is to live the roles they're performing in. You know, uh, opera singers sometimes, or, or I shouldn't say sometimes, in the past, opera singers um, uh, were sort of often given a free pass when it came to theatricality and, 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 the, and the inhabiting dramatically of the parts they were playing. Um, you know, those days are long gone. And the live and HD shows at the Met, I think, have helped, and, and, and other opera houses, uh, audiovisual uh, presentations have helped. Uh, in ridding those kind of non-theatrical practices of singers um, or getting rid of them uh, because singers know that they're going to be seen in close-up. They have to be 
uh, in character all the time when they're on stage. Of course, the, the, that, that kind of theatrical evolution was already happening, thanks largely to the movement of um, Europe, more, I would say more so in Europe, where, where European stage directors and had already started you know, working much more intensely on the complete theatrical realization of operas. And certainly it's been my goal since I came to the Met to bring in uh, leading stage directors from, from Europe, as well as from you know, Broadway and, and the West End to, you know, who aren't satisfied with just having singers parking and, and singing uh, on the stage. They, you know, they want, they view, the, the best directors view opera as a fully theatrical art form, recognizing technically how much harder and challenging it is for singers to sing while acting. But uh, the expectation that they have and I have of singers today is that they are actors um, as well as singers and, uh, and uh, opera audiences will have nothing less than that now. They're used to it. Yeah, that's of course the aspect that we are missing uh, right now. Uh, the acting, the being on stage, um, having the whole thing. Now, one aspect that we are also missing, um, opera, of course, involves not just the great singers, but it involves the orchestra, it involves the chorus, it involves all the stagehands, the technicians, the directors, and many of them, uh, as you already mentioned, have been furloughed um, since the end of March. Um, what, is the, what, is, what does the future hold for them? How will they survive, especially if the lockdown continues for we don't know how long? Well, this is a very um, difficult time for all performers who are out of work, which is most performers, uh, unfortunately. Um, in this country, the, um, it's critical, of course, that the um, stimulus package that provides additional uh, revenues to unemployed um, workers continues and that's really in the hands of the fate of that is in the hands of Congress um, who are wrestling with this new stimulus bill right now. Um, you know, my goal is to find a way forward, but I do know that the, uh, any, uh, any possibility of opera returning um, to full performances in this country um, relies upon a vaccine and a vaccine that will be really available. You know, in Europe, um, in Germany, for example, uh, where the German government, unlike America, where the German government pays all of the salaries and costs of the, of the workers in the theaters, um, th it is possible to, and, and, it, it, and there actually are performances taking place in Germany right now, uh, and the German government, I speak to my colleagues who run European houses, uh, the, the German government is actually mandating that opera houses in, in Germany put on performances. But they're being put on in, in a way that uh, economically would be absolutely impossible in America. They're being put on with very few performers in the pit, uh, observing you know, correct social distancing, uh, no choruses, essentially. Uh, singers who are separated by great distances on the stage and a handful of people in the audience representing the audience. Um, you know, that uh, certainly I'm sure it's exciting and, 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 and important for those artists and, and a great opportunity for artists want to perform. That's what, what they live for. Um, but it certainly isn't grand opera. Uh, and economically, it would, it would be completely impossible for us to, to attempt something like that. You know, the audiences for opera in this country particularly are older. Um, and the even though we've worked very hard to try to win new audiences that are younger, and we have succeeded to, to some degree, um, but the older audiences are clearly not going to come back to the theaters, and, and that includes Broadway as well as opera houses, until they believe it is completely safe. Um, they're not, you know, it's one thing to risk uh, your life... Uh, going to a hospital to have a checkup or, or buying groceries. It's another thing, you know, going to, to, uh, to a theater and sitting for hours uh, um, in a theater. So, you know, uh, there are many things that will have to change in the future. I, I, for certainly nobody is going to return to the opera house until it is safe, uh, both performers and audience members. And um, we have to, you know, that's why it's so important for the Met to, uh, to stay uh, in 
visible and and be active because in order for there to be a chance for the workers the orchestra members the chorus members uh the singers to uh work again at the met there has to be a met for them to return to so you know we we can't afford to subsidize everyone's salaries uh, we don't have the government uh, support to do that um we are uh, providing health care benefits to all of our unemployed workers um, but uh, the cost of running the med is so great that uh, it's just not possible to do more than that now um, and we just need to be able to be ready for to reopen when uh, when it is safe which may not be December 31st as is currently planned do you have any sense of that yet? Well, my sense is that December 31 is an unlikely date. Um, you know, when we, when we announced December 31 was about, I don't know, six or six or seven weeks ago, I think at this point. Yeah. And at that point, it seemed more possible than it does today. Um, yeah. Certainly we're not helped by the fact that uh, um, the, you know, the pandemic is, is, is raging across the country, even if New York city is, is in better shape, but it makes New York much more cautious, rightly so about, yeah. uh, uh, reopening and um, it's you know uh, December 31 I would say is is uh, not going to happen at this point um, our season next next season was planned to be longer than uh, recent seasons in that it was going to extend into early June as opposed to ending in early May so you know my hope is that we will still have a shot at uh, some part of next season um, and that, but that it will depend upon a vaccine being available, yeah. not just being available, but being you know used widely. Yeah. Do you you already mentioned the subsidies in many European countries and opera houses? Do you sometimes envy your colleagues in Europe? The UK government just gave it almost two billion dollar support package for the cultural institutions, including the performing arts. Do you sometimes wish you were active in Europe? Um, you know, there, there are advantages to both systems. You know, European companies are, uh, are envious of the American system because, because uh, the um, American companies have been up until now uh, very successful in, in getting, obtaining donations from the private sector. I mean, and the Met still is successful in that area. Um, and so in America, the American system, as you know, is one in which uh, uh, private donations um, replace government subsidies and the government in turn uh, provides tax incentives uh, to donors, to, to philanthropists who support the arts in America. Um, there are European companies who have lost support from their government in recent years um, who are uh, envious of the American system. Uh, of course, and there are American companies who are envious of the of the European system. So um, obviously, you know, it's, it's uh, we'll see who we'll see in the end who's left standing. But uh, I think that um, it's it's not an ideal situation for for any company today. Yeah. The interesting thing you mentioned the constant you constantly have to rearrange this current season or this upcoming season. You arranged the last season. The irony is that you already did so, but for really happy reasons, which is that um, this past season, the production of um, Gershwin's Poggy and Bess and also of Glasses Agnat, and they were so popular that you actually added more performances of the Gershwin to the current run. Has that ever happened before? And did you foresee that these two works would be so unusually popular? Well, Porky and Bess, I, I knew was going to be popular. I mean, as much as, as much as a producer knows anything, of course, you know, it's, it's impossible to know for sure. My, I believed it would be very popular uh, because it hadn't been produced in New York uh, since uh, the first time it was ever done at the Met, which was in the 80s. And so it had been many years, and it's a piece that has um, an appeal that crosses be over beyond the, the traditional opera audience. Um, and the production I thought was, was really excellent. Um, we had a great cast. So it had all the markings of a, of a show that would do well. Akhenaten was more of a surprise, a, a very happy surprise. I mean, uh, in that Philip Glass has a significant following, but 
there was something about this production with, which had a, a, a kind of a metaphysical, mystical quality to it, uh, the including the juggling, that just captured the imagination of the public. Sometimes, you know, you just don't know what's going to, uh, I mean, you know, I knew the production was good, uh, uh, and otherwise I wouldn't have wanted to present it. And but I, I didn't realize it would it would take off the way it did, which was very gratifying. And also, you know, it's uh, it's it's that kind of success that gives one hope for the future of opera, because when works that are that are outside the mainstream repertoire do as well as Akhenaten did or Poor Game Best, it makes you realize someone sitting in my shoes um, that uh, the commissioning of new work uh, and uh, the the uh, uh, the attempt to to do new 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 things on stage uh, is the right direction. Uh, opera has no chance of succeeding uh, if it rests rests on its uh, past laurels. It, it, has, it has to be constantly innovating and moving forward. Indeed, and um, in terms of commissions, there have been some really exciting recent developments. In 2018, the Met commissioned the first two women composers, Janine Tesori and Missy Mazzoli. I think last year you commissioned uh, an opera to be revised by Terence Blanchard, who will be the first African-American composer to present an opera on the stage. Can you tell us more about these initiatives and maybe other things in the pipeline? Well, you know, the. Uh, when I came to the Met, we started a commissioning program uh, that was uh, sort of a two-pronged program. One was uh, more direct commissions, and also there was a development, a developmental program for new work that uh, we put together uh, together with um, Lincoln Center Theater. Andre Bishop, who was the artistic director of Lincoln Theater, Lincoln Center Theater, and I agreed on on this collaboration that uh, in which we would. Uh, be the kind of uh, marriage brokers between young composers and and sophisticated theatrical librettists, uh, drama, dramatists, and to try to and and stage directors and bring them all together in a kind of a laboratory situation and try to uh, help push forward new work. And that, that resulted in several uh, works that made it to the stage of the Met, including Nico Muley's uh, Two Boys, uh, followed by Marnie. Um, uh, and, and this fabulous uh, new work by uh, one of the youngest and most successful American composers, Matthew O'Coin, who uh, wrote an opera called Eurydice, which is uh, the, uh, an opera based on the very successful play by Sarah Rule, the American playwright, who adapted her play and wrote the libretto for this opera, which is uh, uh, the Orpheus story, but from Eurydice's perspective. And uh, like many new works that we commissioned, we uh, launched it not in New York, but in LA. And it actually played in LA in the, in the fall um, because our, our goal with new work is to give them, give them a chance to be performed elsewhere so that revisions can be made. And uh, mm -hmm. because every new work needs, to, needs something to be done. To, uh, and, the workshop uh, process. Right, but it is, this was much more than a workshop. It was the premiere in, in LA and it was very successful and it's a wonderful work and uh, uh, it will be in the 21-22 uh, um, season of the Met. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, uh, another new work of ours, another work that was commissioned uh, jointly by uh, Lincoln Center Theater and the Met was about to open at Lincoln Center Theater when the health crisis hit, just literally days away from its opening, mm -hmm. which was an adaptation of uh, Lynn Nottage's play, Intimate Apparel. Lynn Nottage, as you know, is one of the leading African-American um, uh, playwrights in this country. And so she, her play, Intimate Apparel, was she herself adapted into a libretto uh, that, uh, for an opera written by Ricky and Gordon that was about to open the, at Lincoln Center Theater. Um, and then, you know, when Unique Nazet Sagan joined the Met as music director, uh, which is one of the most exciting developments for the Met in recent years, uh, he brought with him his own ideas of composers who he was very interested in championing, including Missy Mazzoli. Uh, uh, and Janine Tesori is somebody who, uh, somebody who I've admired for years um, uh, through her theatrical work, um, as well as her, as well as her classical work, and uh, so both of so they were both added to the program, 
um, as the, I mean, remarkably the first two women to be commissioned by the Met. Um, and uh, um, Terence Blanchard's work is, you know, when I, before my, my previous job, before I came to uh, the Met was, I was the head of a record label, uh, Sony Classical. And it was there that I met Terence Blanchard many years ago. And I've known him for many years, and he's he's a brilliant composer who has had many very successful film scores. Uh, he's he did the film score for Spike Lee's most recent film, and um, also for Black Klansman. And he he um, um, has written two operas now. He wrote uh, an opera called Champion about uh, which is autobiographical, uh, an opera uh, based on the life of the former middleweight champion boxing champion, Emil Griffith. And that was done in St. Louis, which also commissioned uh, Fire Shut Up In My Bones, which is a, an, adapt, an operatic adaptation of a, of a memoir by Charles Blow, the New York Times columnist. And uh, both of these works were really sophisticated and, and, and very emotionally charged, powerful works. And uh, in the case of uh, Fire Shut Up In My Bones, um, we asked him if he would expand the work uh, for the Met, uh, and which is something he's working on now. So we're very excited about the premiere of that. Um, uh, all of these works are, are um, in the case of Fire Shut Up In My Bones, it's, as I said, it's an autobiographical, it's based on the autobiographical memoir of Charles Blow, which is the story of, of Blow as a young man growing up in the South young African-American man growing up in the, in the South and the, uh, the sexual, he was, there was, his um, cousin was a sexual predator who, who uh, preyed upon him as a child. And the story is it's kind of a coming of age story about in spite of the, of this kind of emotional scar that he bore uh, when he w went left home to go to college, he was filled with this kind of murderous rage and wanted to come back and and, and get revenge by killing uh, this this cousin and uh, ultimately didn't and therefore saved his own life uh, mm -hmm. in the process. Um, it's a very powerful story. The um, uh, the Janine Tesori opera is about um, is based on the play by George Brandt, who also wrote his own libretto. Um, for the opera, uh, which originally was a monologue about a, a U.S. Air Force pilot, who, female Air Force pilot, who uh, uh, is grounded, hence the title of the of the play and, and the opera, um, uh, because she has she gets pregnant uh, unexpectedly, and instead and keeps the baby, uh, but in so doing destroys her her career in the Air Force because they won't let her fly again. Instead, she's a, she, she stays in the Air Force, but instead of letting her fly, which is where she finds uh, freedom and happiness, uh, she is con assigned to an underground uh, um, uh, secret uh, location somewhere in the Nevada desert where she is assigned to drone duty and uh, operates uh, 12 hour, for 12 hour shifts, uh, commands a, an assassin drone on the other side of the world, taking out Middle Eastern targets. Which gradually drives her crazy. It's a very, it's a very dramatic but timely story. And uh, um, the Missy Mazzoli opera is um, based on the uh, prize-winning book by the novelist George Saunders called *Lincoln and the Bardo*, which is uh, a very uh, unusual and uh, kind of otherworldly, literally uh, otherworldly story that takes place in a, in a mostly in a cemetery outside of Washington D.C where various um, uh, um, occupants of the cemetery do not accept the fact that they have died. And they, uh, they're sort of living in this, in this nether purgatory world um, and trying to, trying to hang on instead of going on to their ultimate destinations of heaven or hell. And the, and the action turns around uh, Abraham Lincoln and his 11-year-old uh, son who dies, Willie, who dies of cholera and who is uh, transported to the cemetery and Lincoln keeps visiting him because he doesn't want to let go of his dead son. And, and, and so and in, in his visits, he connects with these spirits who are, who are haunting this place and uh, that he becomes the, uh, 
uh, the, the lever that transforms the action. It's, very, it's, a, it's a very unusual story. Anyway, that's, that's the state of some of our opera plots of the future. That's fantastic. It sounds like you're very excited about that, as I'm sure will be lots of audiences. Um, are you keeping up with new operas that are being developed elsewhere to scout out new possibilities and composers? And even in New York, there's so much um, talent right now and some, such a vibrancy of the opera scene in right. terms of prototype festival and, and you know, young composers. Absolutely. Trying out new things. We have, and we have a number of young composers who are still in our program, and who were, mm -hmm. who, and we're attracting new young composers mm -hmm. to our program. And uh, we, uh, Paul Cremo, who is the Met's resident dramaturg and uh, uh, driver of our composing commissioning program, is on top of that. We, you know, we uh, we have a talent scout system around the world, and we're also interested in in works, as you said, that are being developed in other countries. Uh, if not for the pandemic, I would have been an ex. Uh, at the end of June mm -hmm. to see the premiere of Kaya Sariajo's new opera, Innocence, mm -hmm. which uh, I'm very interested in um, and hopefully might be able to bring to the, to the Met at some point in the future. And uh, John Adams is writing a new opera uh, mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, Antony and Cleopatra, the Shakespeare play that actually mm -hmm. was last attempted um, uh, uh, for for the opening of the Met in 1966, but uh, was not a success when, yeah. when, that was, when that was turned into an opera. Oh, but yes, so we'll have a redo. <laughs> Fantastic. What other developments you think, what, what chances might this pandemic bring you and the opera in terms of thinking through what might opera need to develop, you already mentioned, new audiences, um, do you see any silver lining in terms of having the space now to explore new avenues for opera? Well, the silver lining is, is I mean, it's not, it's, it's a silver lining I wish we didn't have <laughs> because I'd much rather there, was, there hadn't been a pandemic, but it gives us an opportunity to rethink everything. You know, we have to look at the economics, we have to look at the, which have long been challenging and, and impractical. Uh, we have to look at the, the rigidness of the scheduling of opera and try to make it less rigid. And we have to think about how we can present more new experiences for our audiences. Because clearly, if, if, if the older audience is going to be reluctant to come back, we're going to have to figure out ways to get new audiences. Uh, and it's something we should be doing anyway, and we have been doing. But I think we have to put greater emphasis on it. We're looking at everything from how we schedule operas, what time the curtain time should be, how to make operas shorter. Operas are generally too long, um, uh, whether it's stripping out intermissions or making cuts in operas that should be cut. Uh, you know, there was a long, there was a long practice, uh, an academic practice, I should add, of, uh, of, of believing that operas were only as good as every, every single note that the composer had written, even when the composer themselves have, had rejected them. Um, critical editions of operas um, have abounded in, in recent decades that actually made operas longer than they were ever meant to be. Um, you know, uh, and, and part of, uh, the, I think, and one, of, one of the things that we need to do today is to look at those operas. I'm not, I'm not talking about you know, the, the bona fide um, epics like you know, the Ring Cycle or Parsifal, um, but which, which I think should be the length they are because they are you know, epics. Uh, but but there are you know Handel operas and uh, some uh, Verdi and you know early Verdi operas and that just you know don't need to be as long as they are and and uh, you know I remember you know there have been these kind of academic exercises that have uh, taken place a couple of years ago I remember Ricardo Chailly, a conductor who I admire greatly, decided that he had to put on the original version of Madame Butterfly. Uh, at La Scala for some kind of uh, uh, reasons which I, uh, are beyond me, uh, which is actually the version that was a, was a failure when it was yeah. premiered in, uh, at La Scala, uh, you know, in, in issue, originally. You know, the, more the, offensive. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, you know, composers change their works according to how they were received and, you know, um, and made cuts and, and, and eliminated parts. And, and there was a reason for that. So why academics feel they had to, you know, take, find these, it's like, you know, finding bits of film on the cutting room floor and, and, and gluing them back on. Uh, today, we can't afford those. Those are kind of uh, indulgencies 
that um, shouldn't exist. And particularly when we have an audience, audiences that do not want to sit uh, for long periods of time. And, and with the pandemic, it's a good reason not to sit for long periods of time, which is, uh, it's not healthy. It's healthier to, to, yeah. to, to, to you know, to have a, um, a more reasonable theatrical experience. So, um, you know, we're looking at all of these things. Interesting. A lot of Broadway works, but also a lot of new operas kind of adhere to a 90 minute format, often without intermission. Right. Could well, you imagine not, that for new works, like as a no go to, a new go to? I, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily, I certainly, I think for new works, it's something to consider. Um, you know, that's not the way we have, we have been counseling opera composers to write works that are no more than two and a half hours. Um, but uh, certainly there's a place for shorter works than that, I would say, as, as well. You know, I think, um, um, I mean, right now, you know, at the Salzburg Festival, they're planning a 90-minute version of Cozy Fun Tutte because they know that nobody will want to go to the restroom. So, so uh, um, I don't know. You know, that, there, that, that may be too extreme, but uh, um, certainly we have to think about all these things. Fascinating. Um, what are some other challenges you think opera is facing these days besides the pandemic and the economic challenges? Well, just being, you know, the biggest challenge is, is, I mean, all of those, all of those challenges, economic challenges, the running times of operas, uh, uh, the, you know, what we're, the danger opera faces is becoming obsolete. Uh, you know, it's nobody, the, the idea that opera can exist simply because it has existed is a ridiculous proposition uh, and, and a recipe for disaster. So uh, we have to keep be mindful of the fact that every art form has to evolve and 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 adjust to the circumstances in which it exists. The public's tastes. The uh, uh, it's not to say that we have to pander to the public, but we have to we have to be able to stimulate them and lead them um, and. You know, it doesn't pandering to the public doesn't work either. Um, but but we can't just sit idly by, and I don't think anybody in my position believes that you can. Uh, yeah. that, that might have been the case twenty or thirty years ago, uh, where people who ran opera companies just basically thought they could coast, you know, along. But clearly, mm -hmm. that's hasn't been the case for 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 some decades, and certainly yeah. isn't the case today. And there's also the fact that opera is originally a European art form. It is often considered to be elite um, here in this country, but there is also the question of diversification. Um, and you know, we've, we've seen you're doing it on the level of composers and the stories that are being told. Do you have particular plans also for diversifying the singers, the staff, um, everybody, including then also the audience? Well, I mean, it's, it's essential. It's an essential part of what we're talking about, which is how do you adjust to uh, the society and how do you connect with the society? And certainly every cultural institution is going through a painful soul searching uh, process right now that, you know, was driven very much by recent, recent events. Um, but it, it's, it's certainly the right thing to be doing. Um, I, uh, you know, we we are looking at all aspects of our of, of the institution, from management levels to the artists we engage, um, to uh, the makeup of our board, to you know, really really all aspects of the institution. And we're taking some very concrete steps right now um, uh, to to make changes. On the other hand. We can't just make change for the sake of making change. We have to make change that's meaningful and that, and that makes artistic sense. I mean, the biggest problem with the arts is the pipeline. Uh, yeah. And that, you know, the, uh, one of my colleagues was explaining to me the other day, uh, uh, Deborah Border, who runs the New York Philharmonic, was explaining to me that, you know, to become, and she was a former uh, uh, member of an orchestra in her youth, uh, uh, that the, you know, if you, to become a member of an orchestra, a top orchestra, it starts with the music camp you were select in America. It starts with the music camp that you've been selected to join. And 
and then the, the, those camps feed into the elite music schools and, and those elite music schools feed into the orchestras. Um, so, you know, how do you disrupt that pipeline? Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of it is through recruitment of, of young talent. And, and the same thing is true, obviously, at the Met, you know, not just with our orchestra, but with our chorus and with our stagehands and with uh, uh, all aspects of the operation. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, so one concrete step we're taking right now is we've elim we're eliminating, uh, free interns. When I arrived, yeah. it was always, there was an intern program at the Met where we would bring on interns, uh, who, who would work at the Met in exchange for college credit. Uh, we realize that that is preventing us from, from being able to uh, achieve the diversity we want to achieve. So we're now having, we're creating a paid intern program and we are going to recruit, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, from schools and uh, to make sure that, 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 that will help ensure without, without, um, uh, um, without doing sort of exercising reverse discrimination, we'll, we'll ensure that we are actually um, creating a much more diverse uh, entry level workforce at the Met. And, yeah. and, you know, this goes across the board, whether it's, you know, uh, directors designers i mean we really have to get to the get to the uh the the uh to, to, to the pipeline itself yeah and you also have a very active education department with uh they're doing a summer camp right now that's right that's part of that initiative well the summer camp i mean our education department is fantastic and they and they have uh, their uh they came up with this idea of this uh summer camp and it's been a big success and um certainly uh it's an opportunity for diversity um and uh um and also you know just uh, the joyful participation uh in in the operatic process uh for, for for young people which they're enjoying very much great do you have any secret hopes and ideas or fantasies that you would like opera to take directions you would like opera to take even if it may not be right now or anytime soon well, you know, for me, the great, the greatest uh, part of opera is when it it can uh, affect people's lives in a in a meaningful way. Um, can you know, opera at its best is the most glorious art form. It involves all of the performing arts and visual arts, and uh, nothing makes me more excited uh, when we're able to bring um, new technologies, new artistic ideas to the stage of the Met and then seeing them have a profound influence on the audience. Um, it doesn't always happen, but when it does, there's nothing more gratifying, both for me personally and for the company and for the, for the, uh, for the audiences. And so I live for those moments, for the moments when we can actually have a positive effect and change people's lives. Mm -hmm. That's, that's wonderful. So, do you think that opera will survive this moment and that the Met will survive? I think opera will survive. Um, whether the institution survive is another story. You know, it's sort of like, you know, did, when the CD died, people, or, or when, the, when the CD started failing and, and uh, people started streaming their music instead of, instead of uh, buying, buying physical product, um, the music didn't die, the CDs died. Um, so, I believe opera is very strong. It, it, there are great artists who want to sing opera. There are composers. More composers are writing new music than ever before. Um, um, I think the art form uh, will survive. There's no question it will survive. The question is, in what form will it survive? And uh, you know whether whether the institutions that uh, or these you know these hallowed uh, um, theaters uh, that, that have presented opera historically over over decades, centuries, the Met's 137 years old. Um, whether they survive is another story. And, um, but they will survive if the people who are involved in these companies from top to bottom uh, are willing to accept the fact that uh, there is no free pass into the future, that we have to all work together to find new ways to make it possible. Um, you know, in a way, uh, the greatest, one of the greatest assets of the Met 
the opera house itself, with, which has 3,800 seats, as you like said at the beginning of our talk, and which has also, you didn't mention, some of the greatest, maybe the greatest acoustics, certainly of a theater its size, and, and better than many smaller theaters. Opera singers love singing on the stage. And that they hear their voices coming back to them, uh, which is what a singer wants to hear when they're singing. And uh, um, it's one of, the, one of the most exciting moments for me is, is being in the auditorium when a terrific new singer who hasn't yet sung at the Met gets on the stage and sings for the first time. And the look in their faces and their eyes of, of amazement and joy at, at knowing how wonderful the acoustics are in a theater that they were probably scared would swallow them whole, but instead actually is, is, a, is a great platform for their singing. Um, that's, you know, that's always very exciting for me to, for me to witness. Uh, but that great asset is also our greatest liability because uh, this amazing theater with all of its wonderful acoustics, its history, its uh, past glories is also kind of an albatross. It's, it's this huge, ungainly, uh, monstrous edifice that um, uh, makes it very difficult to be nimble and flexible. Um, you know, ideally today we would have an opera house that could maybe expand to 3,800 seats, but then also shut down and turn into 12 mini plexes of opera houses. Um, you know, I always, I always am, I'm jealous whenever I go to the public theater in Lafayette street and see all the different rooms and theaters and different shows going on. I wish we had the flexibility to do that. Um, unfortunately the economics of the matter so are so extraordinarily challenging and now more than ever that I'm not able to realize a lot of the, a lot of the plans I would like to put into effect, which include smaller venues where opera can be experimented with. And, and yeah. so instead of that, you know, the Met, um, in fact, one of the projects that we lost because of the pandemic has been to uh, collaborate with other institutions. Uh, we were planning on putting on co-producing or, or participating, I should say, in the BAM presentation of Missy Mazzoli's uh, Breaking the Waves that was going to be conducted by Yannick, our music director, and mm -hmm. include a chamber orchestra of Metropolitan Opera uh, mm -hmm. orchestra players, um, which is my attempt to create a mini Met outside of the Met. Yeah. Um, but with those kind of projects, we will be looking at again for the future. That will give us flexibility. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Peter Gelb, for talking with me today. And I'm sure audiences will be thrilled to hear your ideas and plans for the future. And best of luck to you personally, to the Opera House, to all the artists involved, and all the best wishes. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Very nice talking to you. And uh, we will need your, your, good, your good luck wishes because uh, it's a hard road ahead of us. But one, one, one that we will be able to... Um, uh, travail uh, if, we, if we keep working as hard as we can to, to achieve the right results. Thank you, Peter Gelb. Thanks a lot.